Number 3. The Sumter County Does, also known as Jock Doe and Jane Doe, were two unidentified homicide victims found in Sumter County, South Carolina, on August 9, 1976. They had traveled through various places in the United States before being killed in South Carolina. Each victim had been shot three times, receiving one shot in the throat, one in the chest, and one in the back. The weapon used was believed to be a .357 caliber revolver. The case remains unsolved and neither of the victims' identities have been discovered, although their descriptions, sketches of their faces, dental information, and fingerprints have been distributed across the United States. Authorities have decided to halt the investigation until the victims can be identified. The male victim had been referred to as Jock, which may have originated from the French name Jock, indication he may have been from French Canada. A man who claimed he had met the victims stated that he was told by the male victim that he had left his Canadian family with his girlfriend. The male victim had furthermore stated that his father was a well-known doctor. This supported the theory that his family was wealthy. In the early morning hours of August 9, 1976, the young man and woman were said to have been seen from a distance. It was said they had been dropped off on La Claire Road, a secluded dirt road between I-95 and Lynch's River Road. It is believed that the victims may have had their vehicle hijacked, possibly by hitchhikers. Then, upon exiting the vehicle someone may have shot them both in the back. At 6.20 a.m., a trucker named Martin Durant found the bodies and contacted Charles Graham, an employee at a nearby store. Graham, in turn, contacted the authorities. The woman was believed to be between the ages of 18 to 25 and the man between 18 to 30. The initials JPF were engraved inside the man's ring and a book of matches found in the man's pocket came from a truck stop chain which had locations in Idaho, Nebraska, and Arizona. After information was released to the public, a man from Nebraska stated that he may have performed repairs on a car with Oregon or Washington license plates, whose owners matched the description of the victims. But this uncovered no additional leads. The couple's bodies were kept at a local funeral home in caskets with airtight, see-through lids in hopes that someone would identify them. People from all over the country called to inquire about them, including several parents of young runaways. However, no one was able to identify the bodies. The bodies remained on display until they began to deteriorate. On August 14, 1977, one year and five days after the bodies were found, they were taken to Bethel United Methodist Church Cemetery in Oswego, South Carolina. Law enforcement agencies raised several hundred dollars to pay the funeral home. Their graves have granite markers which read male unknown and female unknown. Number 2 38-year-old hairdresser Patrice Andres disappeared from her hair salon in Cumming, Georgia on April 15, 2004, between 11.37 and 11.50 a.m. Her skeletal remains were discovered on December 6, 2005, in Dawson County, Georgia. There are several suspects in her death, including her husband Robin, two serial killers, Jeremy Jones and Gary Hilton. Despite this, the case remains unsolved. Patrice had a son, Dells Wade also known as Pistol Black, from a previous relationship. He was in 10th grade when she vanished. Every morning, she would wake him up by turning on the treadmill and running. This is what she did on April 15, 2004. The two argued briefly that morning because he was in a hurry to get to school. He wanted to get there early so that he could talk to his girlfriend before class. That morning, Patrice dropped him off at school. She told him that she loved him and would see him in the afternoon. He told her that he loved her too, that was the last time he ever talked to her. Later that day, Pistol was in biology class when a school resource officer came in and took him to the office. He asked if he had spoken with his mother, to which he replied that he had not. He then asked if there was any way that he could get in touch with her. He called her on his cell phone, but she did not answer. Normally, if she did not answer, she would immediately call back. However, he called three times and got no answer. He knew that something was not right. Patrice was extremely involved in Pistol's life. She went to every meet and game of his. She always wanted him to be happy. Patrice owned her own salon. Her friend Nancy Hunt recalled that she was always fun to be around and was still positive and smiling. She always tried to make others feel special. According to Nancy, her salon was her dream, and she was very proud of it. Her husband Rob was the one that helped her start it. Rob and Patrice met when he was 50, and she was 30. At the time, she was renting a chair at a two-station beauty salon. 
The two first met when he stopped there to get a haircut. They fell in love and later married in 1997. They were together for seven years, which he considered the happiest times of his life. He recalled that the community and her customers loved her. Patrice and her close friend Anne would hang out in the salon, since the salon was close to Anne's house. She always went there every afternoon to visit her. She remembered when she saw her the night before her disappearance. Patrice said, Woman, are you going to be back here tomorrow? And Anne responded that of course, she would be there. Normally, Anne would call Patrice on her cell phone. On the day of her disappearance, her calls went straight to voicemail. Police had received a 911 call from a customer who had arrived at the salon and found it empty. When officers arrived there, they found the cash register open and money missing from it. Her purse and car keys were laying on the counter. It appeared that she was about to warm up her lunch, as it was found on the counter next to the microwave. There was no blood or overturned furniture. Patrice's husband Rob was contacted at work at around 2 p.m. and told that she was missing. When he arrived at the salon, detectives told him that they planned to interview him. He realized that he was being considered a possible suspect. Investigators noted that they initially were unsure whether or not Patrice was a victim of a kidnapping. There was nothing in or around the salon that indicated a crime had occurred. The only thing that was out of place was her black Chevy Tahoe, which was parked in front of the salon facing in a westward direction. This was strange because, according to her customers and loved ones, she always backed into the spot on the side of the building so that she was closest to the side door. It is not known if she or someone else moved the car. Police began a search of the area however, no trace of Patrice was found. It was hoped that she was alive and had just left voluntarily but her family believed that Patricia would never leave her son behind willingly. About two weeks before Patrice's disappearance, she said to her son Pistol if I was to ever go anywhere, where would you go, he said, I don't know, my dad's house I guess. He recalled that she did not specifically say that she was going to leave. Instead, she was bringing up a scenario of what if something happened, he did not think anything of it at the time. Investigators built a timeline to determine what happened on the morning of Patrice's disappearance. She had customers in her salon the entire morning. Based on her appointment book, they were able to determine who was there. The first client, Pam Shepard, arrived at 8.50 a.m. for her 9 a.m. appointment. She recalled that Patrice seemed distracted and was not very attentive to her. At 11.05 a.m., Pam left the salon. At 11.10 a.m., Paul Kenter arrived for his haircut. He left at 11.27 a.m. As he was leaving the salon, he got a phone call which was verified by cell phone records. At 11.35 a.m., a customer called to change an appointment. She recalled that Patrice was somewhat short on the phone, which was unusual for her. The call lasted about two minutes. Based on phone records, the next call came in at 11.50 a.m. She did not answer this call. Investigators believe that something happened to her within the 13 minutes between 11.37 and 11.50. Outside of Patrice's salon, at around 11.45 a.m., two independent witnesses saw another car in the front of it. As witness Tommy Fincher came over the hill, she first noticed Patrice's car. She then noticed a Chevy Lumina, which was pulled directly into the salon. It had a Georgia Quail wildlife tag. The front door to the salon was open. She saw two women around the Lumina, a taller, dark-haired lady near the salon's front door and an older lady on the passenger side. They had their hands on each other. She was not sure if one had tripped and fallen or was pushing the other over, but she was sure it did not look normal. The second witness was driving by the salon at approximately the same time. However, he believed the second vehicle was a Ford Taurus, possibly a Malibu. He also reported seeing a man with shoulder-length hair standing next to the car. Both witnesses are considered credible because they described essentially the same thing and were totally independent of each other. Family and friends recalled and Rob was overly protective of Patrice, always hovering whenever he was around her. He was jealous of Patrice's relationships with her friends. Friends recalled Patrice was not happy and that she and Rob fought often. He apparently wanted her all to himself. He also did not understand why Patrice gave Pistol so much attention. He thought that he was not getting attention because Pistol was getting it. The day after Patrice went missing, Rob changed all of the locks on the doors to the house. He would not let Pistol in to get his clothes or any other possessions. Pistol knocked on the doors and windows, but Rob would not answer. Rob claimed that he did this as a precautionary measure. He said that he did not want Pistol in the house because he did not like him. He wanted him to stay somewhere else so that he knew he would be safe. 
He also did not want to have to put up with him. In January 2005, a man by the name of Jeremy Jones was arrested in Mobile, Alabama for the murder of a woman there. Investigators noted that he was easy to talk to, but also seemed to have a demon inside him and liked to sexually abuse and kill women. He confessed to the murders of at least six women. He then told investigators that he needed to tell them about a hairdresser in Georgia. Jones confessed to Patrice's murder. He claimed that he would become an evil person while high on drugs. In his confession, he said that he was passing by when he decided to approach the salon. He came inside and told her that his car needed a jump. Outside, he pulled out a knife and forced her into his car. He told her that he would kill her if she tried to escape. He drew a diagram of where her vehicle was parked and where he parked his vehicle, the depiction was accurate. He claimed that, after killing her, he took her to a bridge above Sweetwater Creek in Douglas County and dumped her into it. Investigators brought in cadaver dogs, boats, and search and rescue personnel to the creek. Despite an extensive search, no trace of Patrice was found. Investigators began to suspect that Jones may have made a false confession. Ultimately, he recanted it. No evidence was found to link him to Patrice's case. However, he has not been eliminated as a suspect. In fact, one investigator noted that there were things Jones told them that he felt were impossible for him to know unless he had been to the salon. On December 6, 2005, 20 months after Patrice's disappearance, a man named Albert Clark and some friends were working at Lebanon Baptist Church, six miles from the salon, when they took a snack break on the back steps. They noticed a ton of flies were flying around in the nearby woods and decided to go over and see what it was. After finding a dead deer, his friend noticed a white object nearby. They then realized that it was a human skull they immediately contacted the police. The Dawson County Sheriff's Office contacted investigators in coming and told them of the discovery. The area was extensively searched and more remains were found. They were confirmed to be Patrice's. Pistol was at school that day when he was called to the principal's office where he discovered that his mother's remains were found. The area where Patrice's remains were found was very rural and remote. According to investigators, it would have been difficult to carry dead weight over that terrain. However, they noted it was possible that she was walked into the area. It is also possible that her body was dragged to the area. Pistol told police that he believed Rob had something to do with Patrice's murder. He believed that her trying to get a divorce from Rob played a major part in it. He believed that Rob would have been very jealous if she left him for someone else. Patricia's friend Nancy also told the police that they should look at Rob. She knew that Patrice had not been happy with him. According to investigators, Rob was thoroughly investigated and they created a timeline of his day. They noted that while this timeline does not eliminate him from being involved, it greatly reduces the chances that he could have done it. They also could not eliminate a murder for hire scenario, however, they did not feel that was probable. They uncovered nothing that suggested he did that. Investigators are certain that whatever happened to Patrice occurred in the 13 minute window between 11.37 and 11.50 a.m. Despite the fact that money was taken from the cash register, they do not believe that robbery was the primary motive. They have noted that salons are rarely targeted for armed robbery because there generally is not much cash available. They have also noted that the road her salon was on was quite busy, with people often coming in and asking for directions or other help. It is speculated that the wrong person came into the store and may have taken her. Investigators believe that the blue car scene outside of the salon is critical to solving the case because the sighting occurred in the 13 minute window. They hope to find someone who owned that type of car at the time Patrice's disappearance. Patrice's wedding ring is also missing. It has a 1.5 carat pear shaped diamond with two other 14 carat gold rings attached. There are some aspects of the investigation that investigators refuse to discuss because they define it as guilty knowledge information. This is information only known to the killer and the police. This information helps to substantiate or disprove a confession. When Patrice's remains were brought to the funeral home, Rob asked the staff to reassemble her and lay her out for him to see. They did just that. Placing the remains in the correct anatomical position. When that was finished, the director brought Rob into the room with the remains. Rob then picked up her skull and carried it around for a few minutes. He then put it back and kissed her goodbye. Patrice was later cremated. When her ashes were given to Rob, he kept them in his bed with him for over a year. He described them as his teddy bear because when she was alive, he would do the same thing with her, snuggle together in bed. He said that it brought back good memories for him. He also said that he has her. 
and that's a good thing. He now keeps her ashes in a box in the bottom of a closet. He has never shared the ashes with anyone, even Pistol. Pistol confirms that he has never received any of Patrice's ashes. He also did not get any of her pictures or other belongings. Despite 15 years passing, he still hopes to get closure and justice for her. Number 1 Blair Adams was a 31-year-old Canadian resident who was found dead in the parking lot of a Knoxville, Tennessee hotel on July 11, 1996. Scattered around his body was nearly $4,000 worth of mixed Canadian, American, and German currency. His death was later discovered to be caused by a blow to the stomach. Authorities found that in the days before Blair's death, he acted very strange, claiming that people were trying to kill him and traveled thousands of miles before arriving in Knoxville. According to his family, he began suffering from mood swings. He also started having trouble sleeping. When his mother asked what was wrong, he said that he couldn't tell her about it. On July 5, 1996, he took all the money out of his savings account, along with thousands of dollars in jewelry, gold, and platinum. And on July 7, he went to the Canadian-American border, but was denied crossing because he was a single man with a large amount of money, which fit the profile of a drug trafficker. The next day, Blair arrived at his work, a construction company in Surrey, British Columbia, and quit. That afternoon, he spent $1,600 on a round-trip airline ticket from Vancouver to Frankfurt, Germany. His flight would leave the following day. However, just hours after buying the ticket, he went to a friend's house. He said that he needed to get across the border because somebody was trying to kill him. His friend said that she was unable to help. Then, the next day, July 9th, he turned in his ticket rented a car, was able to cross the border, and went to Seattle. Blair left his rental car at the airport. He then bought a one-way ticket to Washington, D.C. This was strange to investigators because it cost twice as much as a round-trip one. After arriving in Washington, D.C. on July 10, he rented a white Toyota and went to Knoxville. This was also strange because he did not know anyone in the area. Blair arrived at a gas station at 5.30 p.m. and told the attendant that his rental car wouldn't start. The attendant told him that he had the wrong keys, so he was stranded in Knoxville. A mechanic took him to a hotel where they claimed he acted nervous, walking in and out of the lobby a total of five times before getting a room. He then walked out of the hotel 12 hours later. Blair's body was found, naked from the waist down, in a parking lot about a half mile from the hotel near Interstate 40 in Knoxville. Authorities believe the fatal attack occurred around 3.30 a.m., a construction worker claimed to have heard a scream coming from the parking lot at that time, although he believed that it was a woman's voice. There were several strange clues at the scene. His pants had been removed in a pulling motion and were turned inside out. His socks were too. His shoes were off and his shirt was ripped open. Along with the $4,000 in various currencies strewn around him, there was also a fanny pack filled with jewelry, gold, and platinum next to him. Perhaps the most strange clue at the scene was the key to his rental car, which he had apparently lost hours earlier. The cause of Blair's death was a violent blow to his stomach. The weapon, possibly a club or a crowbar, also sliced his forehead open. He had chunks of hair missing from his head and he had defensive wounds on his hands. Investigators recovered one long strand of hair from his hand, believed to have belonged to his killer. Certain injuries also seemed to indicate that he was sexually assaulted. Toxicology reports showed no drugs or alcohol in his system. He had not officially been diagnosed with any kind of mental illness. It has also been speculated that possibly a sex act could have taken place in a vehicle. When the struggle began, the killer might have hit Adams in the head, thrown him onto the road, and struck him while driving away. The fatal blow to the stomach could have been caused by the vehicle's front bumper or a kick to the stomach. Cold Case Chief David Davenport noticed Blair had a blackened hand. He might have caught the pavement, how the rocks or pavement will eat you up. One of his hands looked like that, he stated. DNA was recovered from the hair found in Blair's hand. However, a match has not been found. Recently, his mother was re-interviewed. She claimed that he traveled to the American South to attend the Olympics. She also noted that he had previously been in a romantic relationship with a male roommate. This could suggest that his death was the result of a sexual encounter gone wrong. Police at first suspected that Blair's murder was a robbery gone wrong. However, that was ruled out because none of his money or valuables were stolen. They also looked into the possibility that it was drug-related. However, no evidence was found to support that either. 
Finally, they looked into the possibility that he may have been killed by a prostitute or pimp. However, they could find no evidence that he had ever used a prostitute. On the night before his death, Blair was seen with an unidentified man at several restaurants in Knoxville. A composite sketch was made of that man. It is not known if he had anything to do with Blair's murder. Thanks for watching. Make sure you like and subscribe.